If you have uh, watched the news lately at all, you might be depressed. But look up and see the, gra the gathering that we have here today of wonderful, precious young people who have come to this camp from hundreds of miles away, in some cases knowing that this was going to be a week about studying the Word of God, and these young people are interested in that. And you and I might think our society is just completely gone, and yet uh, I'm encouraged by these folks, and I'm also encouraged by our staff. We have an outstanding staff at Foundations, have about three dozen approximate staff members. They've come hundreds of miles with no pay expected, and uh, they just love young people and want to help mold and shape them for eternity. And we're blessed to have an outstanding staff both here at the school working to prepare for foundations and then once foundations get started to have everyone working together in concert. It's an exciting, exciting thing. We started in 2007 with about 27 young men. And then the next year we were up in the mid-30s. The year after that we got up in the 40s. As it grew, we got up in the 70s for young men, and then someone suggested we train young ladies also with a separate curriculum, and we started doing that, and now we have 148 campers here this week, and uh, we're excited. Uh, we have more girls than boys now, actually, but uh, we're glad to have all of them here, and thank you for making them feel so welcome. Now, what is it that you need more than anything else in the whole wide world? What do you need? What do I need? It just so happens that the text that we're reading congregationally in the growing together part of our 2023 year, Romans 4 through 8, it just so happened that it fit perfectly with our chosen theme in Christ alone. And in these chapters, we see exactly what sinners need if we are a sinner, if we fall into that category. And the Bible does show us in those first parts of the book of Romans. Your reading from last week included chapter 3 of Romans, which discusses the fact that Jews and Gentiles were all under sin. Genesis, excuse me, uh, Romans chapter 1, the Gentiles are sinful. Romans chapter 2, the Jews are sinful, and we know that uh, according to Romans 3, those Jews who lived under that law of Moses could not keep it in the sense of never needing salvation. They were never going to be able to save themselves by themselves because all the world had become guilty before God. Now, I don't like feeling guilty. What about you? I don't like feeling guilty, and thanks be to God, I don't have to. I don't have to walk around feeling condemnation and guilt, even though I might have transgressed the law of God, and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God in Romans chapter 3. For those who are living under that, that law, there was a way, though, to be justified, not by the law of Moses, but by the one to whom the law of Moses pointed. And that is what we're going to be talking about here in just a moment. But I need justification. I need iniquities forgiven, and I need my sins covered. I don't want to be reminded of the things I've done that I'm not proud of in my life. And you don't have to be reminded of those things. Those things can be covered over by the blood of Christ, as we'll see here in just a bit. Justifying the ungodly. If I have lived an ungodly life, then indeed justification is what I need. I need deliverance because I've, I'm guilty of offenses, offenses against God, and I need deliverance if I'm a sinner that's never received salvation. I need justification. That's why Paul would write, therefore being justified. Yes. I need peace. I don't want to live in turmoil, and sin never does satisfy, does it? There's no peace to the wicked, Isaiah would tell us, and we have peace in, of course, a particular place 
and we have access. I need access to, to get into the grace of God. How am I going to be able to access that grace? That is part of what we're going to discuss this morning. I need reconciliation according to Romans chapter 5 and verse number 10. I want to be bought back, brought back to God in reconciliation. And I need to be put at one again with God. I need atonement. These are all things I need if I'm a sinner that's not received salvation. And this is a beautiful statement in Romans chapter 6 and verse 18. Being then made free from sin. How would you like to walk around with a yoke of bondage uh, on your neck? This is the way that uh, sin is, reacts or the way that we react to sin. It's like a, a, sl a servant or it's like servants to that slave is what I mean to say. We're made free from sin. And the gift of God is eternal life. I want that. I need that. I need eternal life. I need deliverance. This body of death, that system that I couldn't keep and the system that would not justify me or save me, I need someone to come along and deliver me from the death that sin brings. And I need to live in an uncondemned state. So all of that said, who can do that? Who is the one that can give us everything we just said we need? And the answer is quite clearly spelled out for us. Who fills in these blanks? Can we put Moses or Isaiah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets in these blanks? Can we put Muhammad, Confucius, Buddha? Who could we put in the blank? Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in... Christ Jesus, Christ alone, in Christ alone, we find the salvation, the redemption, the buying back that we need. Who's the only one that could be our sin offering? That's what the word propitiation carries with it. We needed someone to be our sacrifice for sins. The blood of bulls and goats couldn't do it according to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4. But someone's blood could and did through faith in his blood. Now, there have been a lot of people who shed blood for us to be able to be here today. You know that. Memorial Day is not that long ago, and we've remembered those who fought and shed blood on oftentimes fields in foreign places. For your safety and mine, your freedoms and mine. I thank those people every time I think about their sacrifice. It moves me. I'm still moved by our veterans and by the sacrifices that they made, the blood that they shed. But you know, not one veteran has ever shed blood to save my soul. And not one prophet or apostle has ever shed blood to save my soul. There is only one who can save my soul, and that's Jesus Christ my faith must be in his blood. We just remembered that blood a few moments ago when we partook of the Lord's Supper and remembered that shed blood that flowed from his head, his hands, and his feet. Yes, Jesus our Lord is the one who was delivered for our offenses. He's the one that was raised again for our justification. And therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Tell me who can fill in these blanks. How many people can fill in the blanks on the screen above? How many? Just one. In Christ alone, we find the fulfillment of this passage because it is our Lord Jesus Christ who justifies us. It's our Lord Jesus Christ who is our peace, who gives us peace. Notice verse 2. I said earlier, we need access. How am I going to get access to where I need to be? By whom? That's a reference to Jesus Christ. I need access and I can take Jesus Christ and follow him and he will lead me to the place where I can access the grace of God. One of the most beautiful passages in all of scripture is Romans 5, 6 and following. So tell me who fills in this blank? Who died for the ungodly? There's only one name that could possibly go there and that is the anointed one, Jesus Christ. He died when we were yet without strength. We couldn't do it ourselves. 
He was the one who died for the ungodly. Now, it's rare to find someone to die even for good people, for righteous people. That's not something you see every day. But it's very rare to see someone die for those who are blatantly wicked and opponents and enemies. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is a beautiful concept to think about, that Jesus Christ would die so that I could be justified by his blood, his blood. And notice, I can be saved from wrath. We just sang in that song, the wrath of God was satisfied when Jesus died. And that's exactly what we see here. We shall be saved from wrath through him. He's the one, the only one. His blood is that which can cleanse us, can reconcile us. In fact, how can an, a separated sinner be brought back into a relationship with a holy God? Here is the answer. We were reconciled to him by the death of his son. That is the way. And when you picture Jesus Christ hanging on the cross and stretching out his arms and having nails driven through his flesh, fastening him to that cross for six hours, I want you to think, and I will think too, about how as I see that in my eye of faith, I can see him hanging there and I can say to myself, thank you for reconciling me and saving me by your, your life and your death. I'm so thankful. You brought me great joy, Jesus. Nothing else has ever brought me the joy that you've brought me. No substance on earth can do it. No human being on earth as a companion can do it. No amount of material wealth or house can do it. The only thing that can really give me everlasting joy we joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we've received that at one minute, that atonement that brings us together. And it's the grace of God is such a gift. It, in fact, it's called the gift by grace. But notice who fills in the blank to become that gift, that one and only gift. God so loved the world that he gave, but he gave whom? He gave his only begotten son. That one man became indeed became our Savior. The Word became flesh. And that one man, Jesus Christ, is the one who has saved us so that we have now an abundance of grace available and the gift of righteousness reigns in life by how many? In Christ alone, by one. Jesus Christ is the only one that can save you and save me. He's the one. In fact, grace reigns through righteousness unto eternal life, which all of us want. I, I'm not trying to be morbid in any way, shape, or form, but I'm just trying to be real. Young people, every one of you can look down and see some gray hair down here in the balcony below, and the snow is falling on the mountain, very much so for some of us, yes. Do you know every single person that's older that you see here was just the same age as you are now one day? There was a time in our lives when we were exactly the same age as you are now. And I guess every one of us would tell you, don't blink. Because as the old song said by Kenny Chesney, you, you wake up and you say, how, did, how in the world did I go from being so young to now having this time of my life when I'm nearing the sunset years of my life. And so what will prepare you to find eternal life? It is Jesus Christ our Lord. In fact, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Science Is that what that passage says or can say? Can science give you eternal life? I read an article recently about a man who's going to, he said, spend all of his days trying to find a way to never have to die. I don't know. I wish I could talk to him. That, that's already been done. I don't have to die the second death, Revelation 21.8. And if a man keeps my sayings, Jesus said he'll never see death. 
John 8, 51. And so the death that I'm going to die physically, as all men are appointed to do, Hebrews 9, 27, is just a means to an end. It's not the end. It's a means to an end. And that end is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's the one, the only one, who can give you eternal life. There's no fountain of youth to be found anywhere else. It was the Apostle Paul who, thinking about being under the law of Moses, said, Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And then he answered the question in the very next verse. I thank God through... Paul, who did you put in those blanks? Who would you put in that blank? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. He is the one in whom there is no condemnation. There is therefore, and remember the book, chapter, and verse divisions in your Bible and mine were not put there by the original authors, meaning that the very end of Romans 7, Paul's question, is really continually answered in chapter 8 where he says there's no condemnation to those who are in, in, in whom? Moses, Jeremiah, no, in Christ Jesus he is the one, the only one. Paul would write, I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God. I want the love of God. I need the love of God. Where is the love of God located? In Christ Jesus our Lord. Which brings me to the next to the last question. We've seen what we need. We've seen the only one who can give us what we need. How may we receive what we need from Christ? How do we get it from him, the one and only one who can give it to us? Notice faith is the foundation of it all. In Romans chapter 3, he mentions faith of Jesus Christ unto all them that believe. And so faith is a very important part of this salvation transaction that takes place. The redemption that we need is found in one location, in Christ alone, in Christ Jesus. And that is why my faith must be not in animal blood, not in human blood that was not God in the flesh. My faith is in the blood of the New Testament which was shed for many for the remission of sins, Matthew 26, 28. And the echo of that is right here in Romans chapter 3 and verse 25 which mentions through faith in his blood I'm able to receive remission of sins that are past. Notice, past. If they're in the past, I don't have to think about them anymore. I don't have to linger and dwell in the past. And think about what I used to do because that's all been forgiven by the faith that I have in the blood of Jesus Christ. And believing in Jesus is emphasized in Romans 3.26 and then into our reading for this week, Romans chapter 4. You know Abraham lived before Moses, so Abraham lived before the law of Moses. Can, can a man be justified apart from the law of Moses? Abraham was. He believed God. Faith was the component in the patriarchal age. It's the component indeed in the Mosaic age and the Christian age. But faith in God is not meritorious in the sense that we have earned something. In fact, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. God doesn't owe you or me anything he paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. So I believe on him. I put my trust in his blood as the power to cleanse me. And notice as you just cycle through these verses very rapidly, just about every verse in this section of Romans 4 mentions faith. Faith, belief, belief. And you see it here. It is of faith, Romans 4.16. The faith of Abraham, again, spotlighted in Romans 4.16 and also in Romans 4.18. He believed in hope. 
And he was not weak in faith, we're told, but rather he was strong in faith. Romans chapter 4 and verse 20 informs us. And he was fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. Now let me ask us. Are you fully persuaded that the blood of Christ is powerful enough to wash away every sin you've ever committed if you do what Jesus said to do to receive that blessing? Do you think his blood is powerful enough to cleanse you completely? Or is there something you've done that the blood of Christ just can't touch? He can wash it all away. He can cleanse me completely if I will put my faith in his blood and obey his message. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, then we can be delivered from our offenses. He was raised again for our justification. And yes, repentance has already been mentioned in Romans as a necessary component. The goodness of God makes me want to repent. I don't just hear a preacher saying, repent as a raw command and say, okay, well since, no, it is a command, yes, no doubt. God has commanded all men everywhere to repent, says Acts 17 and verse number 30. But let's ask this question, what would make me want to repent? You see this phrase in verse 4 near the end of the verse, the goodness of God. Jesus Christ lived a perfect life, died as a perfect sacrifice, and God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son to sacrifice himself for you and for me so that we might be saved. Yes, repentance is a part of it. Now, is confession ever mentioned in Romans as a way of accessing what only Christ can give me? Yes. If you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you can be saved. Yes. There's no doubt that confession is important and, and repentance is important and belief is important because with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I would quickly note there are some folks in the religious world that want you and me to believe that God is going to do the believing for us by some miraculous impact of the Holy Spirit that's going to make me believe but this passage says, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. I'm making that decision based on my conviction that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the evidence shows he is. And because I see the evidence, I want to say to the world, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Acts 8, 37. And yes, as a Jew or a Greek, if I've sinned, the same Lord is rich unto all that call upon him. But what does it mean to call upon him? I know whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So says Romans 10, 13. But I know the man who wrote this too, and I know how he was saved. And so I have the best definition possible of what it means to call on the name of the Lord by just looking at how he did it. You remember Saul of Tarsus saw the Lord on the road to Damascus. He believed Jesus Christ was the Son of God at that moment. He already knew it. He was not saved at that moment. He was told to go into the city and there he would be told what he must do. Acts 9, 6. So he waited. And what did he do while he waited? He prayed. And what would you suspect he would... How do you know he prayed, someone says, Brother Clark? Acts 9, 11. Ananias is told, go to this house. Behold, Saul of Tarsus. He's praying. You're looking for the praying man. Well, if the sinner's prayer is the way to get saved, then what a perfect opportunity for Ananias to walk in the door and say, stay right where you are and repeat after me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I make you the Lord of my life. I'm calling on you to be my Savior right now. Friends, may I ask you, is that the way it was done in the New Testament conversion of Saul of Tarsus? Yes or no? No. If it were done that way, that's what I'd be preaching this morning. 
No, you have to believe, but notice you can't call until you first believe. So calling and believing are not exactly the same thing. Because notice, how then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? You start with that conviction, but you don't stay there. In fact, here's how I know that. Saul of Tarsus was waiting, 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 and finally here comes Ananias. And he says, arise and be baptized. What are you waiting for? Now why tarry yourself? Arise and be baptized. And what will that do for me? And wash away thy sins. What? Are we talking magic water in the baptistry? <laughs> no. You just saw the passages. Through faith in his blood. Justified by his blood. We see the blood of Christ as that cleansing agent. When do we contact the blood of Christ? It's very interesting to me that the same man who experienced this wrote this. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, some people want to come to this verse on the screen and they say, see, Paul doesn't say baptism was how he was justified. He says it was by faith. But I know that Paul is not Jekyll and hiding us. He's not uh, doing one thing in one passage and writing something else in another. No, he indeed is the one who, if you'll notice again, was baptized to wash away his sins. Saul did not have peace of mind the moment he believed Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He was told to go and wait. He didn't have peace yet. He couldn't eat. He couldn't drink. And so he's in anguish. Doesn't sound like a very joyous salvation to me because he wasn't yet saved. But now here comes Ananias, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's how Paul said he was saved. And that's justification by faith. It includes water baptism. It is that which brings us peace. When did Saul of Tarsus have peace? Before he was baptized or after it? It was after. Therefore, baptism is a part of what it means to be justified by faith. And to show you how true that is, the very same writer who wrote this, justified by faith, wrote this. We have by access by faith into this grace. And how do we get into that place? He wrote in Romans 6, 3, Know ye not that so many, do you see the word of underline, us? Paul, are you putting yourself in the category of those who entered into Christ in this fashion? Yes. So many of us as were, what? Baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Paul says that's how you get into Christ. By baptism as a penitent confessing believer, and indeed you're buried with your Lord by baptism into death, that just like Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, you would rise up from a watery grave to walk in newness of life. Think about it. You go down into the water and the old man is being crucified, being put to death and buried, and you come up out of that water, and you are going to be a brand new creature in Christ. You've been planted. Now it's time to be raised. Indeed, the old man crucified that the body of sin might be destroyed. And I love Romans six seventeen. God be thanked you were the servants of sin. But, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine What's the form of doctrine? The tupos. It, what's the type? It's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. I have typified that by doing what it says to do. And notice, that is when I'm made free from sin. Being then made free from sin. It is not prior to that baptism. It is after I'm raised from that watery grave that I'm made free from sin. Now, this has always struck me. What would you think of an undertaker in this county... If he took living people and tried to bury them, he'd be on the news, I promise you that. Living people, you don't bury living people. Okay, wait a minute. Our religious friends tell us we're saved first, then baptized to show that we've been saved. Question, if we're saved, are we still dead in our sins? Yes or no? If we're saved, are we dead in our sins anymore? No. We're alive. Well, if we're alive, why would we need to be buried? 
The reason why we need to be buried in a watery grave of baptism is not because we're already alive. It is to be able to be buried to put the old man to death and then rise to walk in newness of life. And that's when we're made free from sin. And notice, this is done from the heart. You know it and you're doing it with that purpose in mind. My dad once was approached by a man, and I, I wish the... Well, I say I wish this were not true. No, that would make him a liar. He's just uninformed and woefully so. He, he came up to my dad. He said, you know how I've been wanting my son-in-law to get baptized, right? Yes, yeah, sure. He said, well, I figured out a way to do it. We were on vacation. We were out in the ocean swimming. I snuck up behind him and I pushed him down. I said, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He popped up. I gave him a big hug and welcomed him to the family of God. Are you serious? You don't, you don't find your way getting into Christ by coercion or someone else pushing you down against your will or without your knowledge or consent. No, you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, and that's when you're made free from sin, and that's when you can say there's no condemnation anymore. I don't have to walk around feeling condemned. Who loves that? No one. I can be in Christ and feel liberated, free. My sins are washed away. I've been redeemed. I'm now bathing in the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And if it's in Christ Jesus our Lord that we find the love of God, how do we get into the love of God? We're baptized into Jesus Christ and thus baptized into his death. And now finally, I ask this question. How should we behave after we've entered into Christ? Romans also answers that. There ought to be rejoicing. People can see that you are, even when you go through trials and tribulations, as you will read the verses after this in Romans 5, but there's something you're hoping for that the world just doesn't have outside of Christ. In Christ alone, we can joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, shall we continue in sin after our immersion into Christ? No, absolutely not. In fact, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? We're actually coming up out of that water with this, this uh, premise in mind. This is our goal. This is our motto, our, our aim in life. I don't want to be a slave to sin. I don't want to be a slave to sin. I'm not going to live for sin anymore. I've been redeemed and delivered from sin. I'm no longer a sinner in bondage. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian and therefore, sin ought not to be reigning in my mortal body. Christ reigns in me, not sin. I am going to yield myself to God as an instrument of his righteousness rather than being an instrument of unrighteousness as I might have once been. This body now belongs to him and I'm going to become a servant of righteousness. That is the goal after I come up out of this watery grave. Indeed, even so now, yield your members, servants to righteousness unto holiness. Now, when you were the servants of sin, what was that like? How'd that work for you? You were a slave and you were free from righteousness. And what fruit did you have in those things whereof you're now ashamed? So many people say, I look back at the way I used to live and I think, what was I doing? I wasn't truly happy. I wasn't really finding any joy, lasting joy. There were moments of temporary sinful pleasure and gratification, but it didn't do anything for me when I got up in the morning and looked in the mirror and said, this is who I am. But when you're a child of God, even though you at times may stumble and fall, you don't have to be enslaved to that kind of lifestyle anymore. The end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin, yes, servants to God, we have another fruit to look forward to. 
The life the Christian lives, it produces something too. It doesn't produce shame the next morning. It produces a joy that says, if I die or if he comes, I'm going to go and live with him and I have eternal life to look forward to. The invitation song is about to be sung. I do not know who has been saved by the blood of Christ in this room and who is not. I know some of you have, obviously, perhaps even a majority. But I would never want to preach a sermon without reminding myself of this reality. Is it possible that someone living and worshiping in this very building right now needs to put on Christ to become a member of the church and a member of the body of Christ? Is it possible your sins need to be wiped away, washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ? If so, then we can help you with that. You don't, you don't have to delay. Maybe you need further study. We'll be glad to do that too. Maybe you know exactly what you need to do. You just haven't done it yet. This is your hour of opportunity. The gift of God, eternal life is awaiting you and you can have it for sure through Jesus Christ our Lord. Maybe you've already been baptized into Christ, had those sins washed away, but now the sin has crept back into your life and now you're not living like you used to for Jesus. You're living like you used to before you became his servant and you need to fix that and we can help you. When you come as a child of God who's gone astray, we can do with you what Peter told Simon the sorcerer he needed to do, repent and pray, and your iniquity can be forgiven. We'd love to see someone find refuge in Christ alone. If you need salvation this morning, forgiveness of sins, covering of sins, purging of iniquity, if you need to be right with your God and Jesus Christ who bled and died for you, the song is about to be sung, and now your decision can be made and you can walk out of here a totally different person than the one you were when you came in this building. Won't you look to Jesus, see his blood flowing from his head, his hands, his feet, and respond accordingly as together we stand and sing. Won't you please? <laughs>